So welcome back everybody and uh, welcome to the very last week. This is, a, as I wrote in the email, it feels a little bit sad always when the semester is getting towards the end. Hopefully, I mean, you've had a fruitful time and uh, uh, I just wanted to bring up the things which we uh, plan to cover this week. So the uh, there is a uh, topic which we or a big topic in machine learning, which we haven't touched upon, which deals with unsupervised learning. And all the cases which we have looked at till now uh, are cases which fall under the common denominator of supervised learning, which often means also that we have, uh, normally we have labeled data. Uh, many of these methods are what we call data uh, greedy. I mean, the more data we have, the better the training normally. And the data, clearly to have labeled data is something which is expensive because normally there's actually a human who has traversed the data and put a specific label in. Now, when you get into uh, terabytes or petabytes or even more of data, it's clear that it's not very likely that you will sit down and actually go through all this data. That would be a, what I would call a waste of uh, uh, human resources. And that, that is where methods like unsupervised learning methods actually come into, into play. And one of the simpler ones is a method which is called principal component analysis. That allows us also to bring up what we discussed in early in the semester when we looked at the singular value decomposition, when we looked at the correlation matrix. This is, uh, in essence, it's a simple method to reduce the number of degrees of freedom. So if you think back to project number two, where you had the uh, cancer data, you had something like 30 features. Now, most likely some of these features are less important than the other ones. And the PCA is actually a way by which you can reduce the dimensionality by diagonalizing your correlation matrix. So what I'm going to do today is to bring back some of the things which we looked at in the beginning of the semester when we uh, studied the uh, ordinary squares and ridge regression in terms of a singular value decomposition. So the singular value decomposition is actually a uh, extremely useful technique, which is going to allow us to uh, see how we can find and determine which degrees of freedom we should neglect and which we can keep. So the key word here is that we are going to maximize the variance from the correlation matrix. And this is going to be proportional to the singular values of a singular value decomposition of our design matrix. You can take another stand, which is a more statistical stand, which we are also going to discuss, which leads to a minimization problem where you keep the smallest error which you can have by just projecting out the degrees of freedom you don't want to have. So there are different ways of deriving it. The PCA has been around for quite some time. Uh, the kind of more geometrical approach with the singular value decomposition is something which came when the singular value decomposition algorithm was introduced. But the original approach was a more statistical based approach, which we're also going to look at. Then there is another method, which is called the, the K-means clustering, which is also a very, simple and intuitive way by which we can reduce the dimensionality. Now, the clustering is a method which allows you to cluster specific events. So the word itself, it actually measures the distance between different events and then clusters them according to those which are closest to each other. And what many people do when you have huge data sets is actually to run it through a K-means clustering algorithm and then you would by hand or by your favorite software, you would then analyze the clusters, which hopefully contain less data. And then you could analyze these with your standard tools for supervised learning. So there is a unsupervised element where you can screen out data, and then you would let your supervised algorithm go through that data in more detail. So often uh, times uh, the case is that your traditional analysis tool is way too expensive when it comes to the number of CPU cycles and dimensionalities 
that it can allow for a proper treatment of these huge data sets. Now in the slides here, uh, you will find also links to some videos. And then tomorrow, we're also going to have a quick uh, summary and overview of what we've done during the semester with links to new courses, which you can follow if you're interested in machine learning. University of Oslo has actually a good selection of advanced courses on machine learning. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is actually to switch back a little bit and uh, look at the uh, our whiteboard and uh, remind ourselves about some basic uh, elements of the singular value decomposition and what we also call the correlation matrix and the covariance matrix. So these are features which uh, I just wanted to bring up again. And so the first topic today is PCA, or principal component analysis. And let's now just switch back to the whiteboard. You will also find, by the way, some basic reading, uh, reading uh, assignments here. So let's uh, bring up the whiteboard and try to uh, look a little bit more into things which we have seen before. So this can serve a little bit as a kind of repetition of what we have done. So one of the first elements which we need to remind ourselves about is the design matrix itself. So let's now uh, dive into the principal component analysis, which I'm just going to show into PCA. So the basic philosophy is that we want to reduce the dimensionality of the number of degrees of freedom. And if you go back to ridge regression and Lasso regression, by tuning this hyperparameter lambda, you were actually able to reduce some degrees of freedom. And if you remember with Lasso, you could actually drive some of the degrees of freedom to zero. Whereas with Ridge, you would simply dampen some of them. And then there would be some of the main features, which would be those which survived in the fitting, which you attempted at. But let's now uh, remind ourselves of the design matrix, which uh, has a dimensionality. We assume that it is a real matrix, N times P. So uh, I'm going to keep with this uh, definition, which we have uh, had through the semester, which means that we are going to uh, use the design matrix with the rows, uh, which now label the data entries and the columns as the entries which label the features which we have. Okay. So, uh, and let's look at a simple example. So suppose now that X is just given by a matrix, which is a three by two matrix. So it has matrix elements X zero, zero, X one, zero, x two zero and then x zero one x one one and then x two one and we would typically rewrite this in terms of two vectors x zero and x one so this is a pretty simple case it could be something which we if we go back to the very beginning of the course where we define a model for a first order polynomial and then we had three data points then one of the quantities which we looked at in the very beginning of the semester was a covariance. So we defined the covariance uh, between two vectors. Let me just remind you of that. So if we have two vectors, xi, xj. So when it's written like this, now these are vectors. This would be given by one over n if we use this unbiased formula. Remember now that if you use numerical Python, since your mean value is not truly independent, then you would have a one divided by n minus one. So in NumPy, this is implement, implemented by default because you're always dealing with a sample mean. But I'm just gonna put one over n since this is what you will see in most textbooks. But keep in mind that when you compare that with NumPy, there's a one over n minus one factor. So this runs now over x and over k. So I would have a matrix element xk of uh, i minus the mean value mu of i multiplied with xk of j minus the mean value of j. And if you now do the algebra here, 
what you would see is that this is something you can easily write if you just let's write it out for the specific case here if we now take these two vectors which we have defined this vector x0 and x1 this is now simply one over n and if i do the math correctly here this should be x0 0 times x0 1 and what i'm going to do now as well um, i need to say something here i'm going to put a bar here x plus an x10 bar and then an x11 plus an x20 bar and this is multiplied with an x21 bar like this and i have defined the matrix elements x bar of i j here this is the same as a specific matrix element x i j minus the mean value of j so if you look at the expression which you have for the, the covariance you're subtracting the mean value here so this is pretty normal uh, and you have done it tons of times when you scale your data we are normally operating with scale data so that means that our design matrix is now being transformed to a matrix which is scaled by subtracting the mean value for each column. Is that is that okay? So you did this in the very beginning of the semester, but this is a standard way of now rewriting this uh, covariance matrix here, or this covariance matrix elements. Now, if you look close at this, you can actually rewrite. So let me just put this in parentheses. So that means that your X, the design matrix, goes over to this X bar, which is now simply a matrix which contains X00 bar, X01 bar, X10, and X20, and X11, and X21 here. So that's the design matrix which we are going to deal with. If you also look close at this now, what you will see is that this covariance of uh, the vectors x0 and x1 and this now we should actually rewrite them as bars here that is given by the vector x0 bar times transposed times x1 bar and you can easily see that if you take these two vectors and uh, take the transpose and multiply it because the covariance is just a number that's a scalar. So you shouldn't take an outer product. Keep that in mind. And this depends all the time on the way I have defined these quantities, the X design matrix, as a matrix where on the rows I have the entry points and on the columns I have the features. So in some textbooks, they reverse the order. Then you have just to be a little bit careful with uh, the way you define your covariance matrix and so on. Now, if you now look at uh, uh, what we have put up here, uh, this is just a covariance between two vectors. And clearly, if these vectors are independent and identically distributed, this covariance is exactly equal to zero. Now, what we can define next is actually the so-called covariance matrix. So with these uh, uh, elements which we have, we can then define what is called the covariance matrix. Some people call this the data covariance matrix. That's another name you will find in the literature. So I define the covariance matrix, but now I'm going to do this for the design matrix. So I'm going to just use a label here where I just label this as C of X, and X is now the design matrix, covariance matrix of our data, which is the design matrix. And this is a quantity, if you now look carefully at the, uh, the definitions here, it's going to be given by this X transpose times X. And X is now this uh, scaled matrix where I have subtracted the mean value from each column. So this is my covariance matrix. And for this specific case, which we have, uh, when this X now is a matrix, the example which we had above here, is a three by two matrix. That means that this matrix C of X 
is a matrix of dimensionality two times two. And you see that quickly because this is, uh, if you take the transpose, it's a matrix two times three times a matrix of dimensionality three times two. So that means that the covariance is something which measures the correlations between your features. So remember again that if you have a polynomial of a certain degree, you would like to find out what is the correlation or the covariance between the one polynomial degree and another polynomial degree. Or if you're looking at some housing data, you would like to find out what is the correlation between a feature like the median price and the average number of rooms the house has. And you would clearly expect that the price should be pretty well correlated with the number of rooms you have. So that would be another example of you setting up a kind of covariance matrix. And this matrix has specific matrix elements. And if you write it out in this specific case, what you're going to have is that this matrix C of X, and just writing it like this, is now a matrix which, uh, for this specific example, is going to have the covariance of X zero with, a, with itself. And it's gonna have a covariance of X zero with X one, which is the matrix element we calculated. And then we're going to have the covariance with X one, X zero. And finally, we're gonna have the covariance of X one, X one. So clearly, if the non-diagonal matrix elements are zero, we call this matrix for D correlated. Now, if you look at the diagonal, this is something we can rewrite in, in terms of a famous uh, quantity. So anyone remembers what this quantity could be? If you look at the diagonal. So let me just uh, show you what the diagonal looks like. Let me just write it down here. So this is a covariance x0 of x0. I just write it now, the unbiased term. So this is a sum of a k equals 0 to n minus 1. And then I have xk 0 minus mu of 0 squared. And this mu of 0, let me remind you of that one as well is simply the sum over one over n k equals zero to n minus one. And this is a sum over x k zero. So if you look at this covariance of uh, a vector with itself, this leads to a quantity which has a famous name. And my hearing is very bad, but I don't hear anything here. The variance. So that means that we can just uh, rewrite this in terms of, uh, so this quantity which you have would now simply be given by sigma zero squared. So I can rewrite this matrix now in terms of a C of X. So this is just a notation I'm going to use here where I have my sigma zero squared. And here I will have a sigma one squared. And then I have these matrix elements. And these matrix elements, as you can see from the mathematical expression for the covariance, these matrix elements have to be the same. So it's a symmetric one. This is a symmetric matrix. You should also keep in mind that this is a positive definite matrix, a positive definite matrix. The variance is always a positive number. The covariance can be negative. But normally what you would have is that the diagonal will be dominate, dominating. And that means that the matrix in general would be positive definite, which means that it has positive eigenvalues. Now, uh, before we move on here, uh, what I wanted to do is actually to bring back uh, uh, some of the elements of the singular value decomposition. So till now, we have just really uh, brought up something which we defined in the very beginning of the semester. So let's now take a closer look at uh, uh, this quantity here, which we had. So let's go back to the singular value decomposition. And this is normally what we call the SVD. 
So what we have then, if we take our design matrix, we can rewrite this in terms of a unitary or orthogonal matrix U times a matrix which now contains the so-called singular values. So the matrix, the singular value decomposition theorem is a theorem which applies to all matrices, even if they're singular. So even a singular matrix can be decomposed in terms of a singular value decomposition. So the, um, the matrix here is something which, uh, if we now look at the properties of these matrices, matrices, this is uh, an orthogonal matrix. The same applies with V. Like that. And this uh, matrix U has dimensionality N times N. So remember now that uh, X has dimensionality N times P. The matrix V has dimensionality P times P. And then the matrix Sigma is a matrix which now contains the singular values, which are all uh, non-zero down to Sigma P minus one. And then we have zero else. And this matrix here, the matrix Sigma has dimensionality N times P. And the singular values, they are defined so that Sigma zero is larger than Sigma one, larger than Sigma two. And this is finally larger than Sigma P minus one, which is larger than zero. And these are called the singular values. These are all positive. That's by definition here. So the theorem is a very powerful theorem because now we can use that one. And as we did uh, back in the beginning of the semester, so let me quickly remind you of that. So what we, one of the things we did then was to rewrite X transpose times X in terms of a singular value decomposition because that gave us now V of T. I got the Sigma transpose times U, I have a U transpose times Sigma times V. And that's something which ended up looking like Sigma transpose times Sigma times V. So why do I bring this up? I bring this up because there's a very nice connection between the singular value decomposition of the covariance matrix and the principal component analysis. So what I'm doing here now is to take this kind of general approach where I now assume that I know the principle of the singular value decomposition. And I'm going to look at the singular value decomposition to say something about how my, uh, I can actually truncate the number of degrees of freedom. So keep in mind now that what we have here is a quantity which depends only on the column vectors, on your features. X transpose times X is a matrix of dimensionality P times P. So the uh, everything which you see here has dimensionality given by the number of degrees of freedom of features which we have. So if we take a closer look at it, if we now multiply with V from the left, or we can multiply with V from the right. So let's rather do it from the right here. Uh, we can multiply it. Let me take that one away, sorry. So if I now multiply with X of T times X with a V of T here. Oh no, sorry. I actually did, a, I, I made a small error here. That's what, what happened. This should be, V here, and it should be a V of T here. Sorry for that. I just messed up the T's here. Like this, sorry. So if I multiply from the right with a V, this is going to be equal to V times Sigma T times Sigma. And we can write this as V times Sigma squared. And this is the same as this matrix V, 
multiplied with this matrix, which now contains the singular value squared. And you can easily see that the matrix now is of dimensionality P times P, like that. Now, what you have next is that this V is an orthogonal matrix. That means that each column vector, which you have, V0, V1, etc., they are orthogonal to each other. So what we have is that V of I transpose times V of J is given by a chronic delta here. So these are orthogonal vectors. So if I just pick one of these vectors, what we are going to have then is the following. So I will have X T times X given by one of these vectors, V of I, that's going to be equal to V of I times one of these singular values. So the question now is, what do we call this object here? Or oh, this equation has a famous name in linear algebra. I hope you don't, it's an eigenvalue equation. So I hope you are not offended if I ask this kind of questions. So this is a standard eigenvalue uh, equation. So that means that the eigenvalues of X transpose X are given by, given by the singular values, given by the matrix sigma transpose times sigma, which we wrote simply like a sigma squared and has eigenvectors And these are orthogonal eigenvectors V of I. Yeah. Yeah. The scalar prop? No, if they're orthogonal, if they are the same I, I. So you're thinking of the, are you thinking of the product which you have? You're thinking of this one? Yeah, that should be equal to one if they are the same. If they're not, it's zero. So this is a definition of an orthogonal basis and it's normalized. So the matrix V and U are orthogonal matrices by definition. And that's what the theorem states that you can decompose any matrix, any matrix actually. The matrix can even be singular in terms of two orthogonal matrices and this matrix, which contains the singular values. So that means that when you do the singular value decomposition, you have the eigenvectors of X transpose times X. So, yeah, so, but that's a chronic delta. Are you, are you, I guess you're familiar with this symbol, right? Because that, that's equal to one, one if I is equal to J and zero else. Okay, okay, that's, so the, uh, the Kronecker Delta then uh, is just a compact way of writing the orthogonality requirement. So the, uh, what you have then is already when you do the singular value decomposition, you have automatically the eigenvalues so what we know then is that this matrix C of X is given by X transpose times X divided by one over N. So that means, that means simply now that the eigenvalues of C of X are given by these values sigma i squared divided by n. So the singular value is divided by n. That's uh, extremely powerful because now we are going to uh, look at uh, when you're calculating an eigenvalue problem. So if you now look at this uh, correlation matrix, and it's a covariance matrix. So instead of now using the singular value decomposition, 
we could now think of uh, finding the eigenvalues of the matrix. So suppose now that you don't know the singular value decomposition. What you could do then is simply to uh, set up the following thing. So suppose now that you, you haven't seen this. So I just brought this up because this is a very elegant result. And remember also that uh, this quantity X transpose times X, the inverse of that one is the variance of the parameter beta in ordinary linear regression. So there are many nice links here which you can make. And linear regression is nice in that sense because you have analytical expressions in terms of your design matrix transposed times the design matrix. That's another of these kind of small hidden gems from linear algebra, which pop up uh, in ordinary least squares. But let's now assume that you don't have the eigenvalues. So what we have is that the expectation value of the covariance matrix. So the, of, or what we have one over N of X transpose times X. This is now given by the covariance matrix. Okay, so the E here is just the expectation value. And this is the sample expectation value. Now, when you want to find the eigenvalues, so now we're supposing that we don't know the eigenvalues or the singular value decomposition. So the standard way for finding the eigenvalues is to perform what we call a unitary transformation or an orthogonal transformation. To find the eigenvalues, of C of X, what you would do then is to perform a orthogonal transformation. So we perform a transformation with an orthogonal or unitary matrix with an orthogonal Or slash unitary matrix which I'm going to call S and this matrix S is equal to S transpose times S and this is just the identity matrix. So the basic recipe when you calculate the, the eigenvalues is simply to take your matrix S times this covariance the object you want to calculate, and then hope that this becomes a diagonal matrix. Normally, you have to do this kind of operations many, many times. So what we're having then is that if you look at the expectation value, so in principle, when we are doing this, this doesn't need to give you a diagonal matrix immediately, but we're assuming now that you get it. So let's call this for a C, in the basis of Y, okay? So this is our transformed covariance matrix, okay? And we know that the covariance is now, so the expectation value of this uh, uh, matrix, this covariance here. So there's gonna be a new matrix. So if we now take the expectation value of this quantity, or rather, Let's now write it out as we did before. So this is the new matrix. And we take now the one over N. Actually, we don't need the one over N because that is implied by the expectation value. So we're taking X transpose times X times S. Now S is a matrix which is deterministic. So that means that its expectation value is just a matrix itself as you did before when you calculated the expectation values for ordinary least squares. So we can actually write this as the transformed of the expectation value of uh, X transpose times X multiplied with S of T. And this is going to be nothing but this new uh, correlation matrix. So this is S multiplied with the correlation matrix, the covariance matrix, sorry. And we simply call this for a matrix Y here. 
and we're assuming that this matrix is diagonal. So it's going to have matrix elements, which are now given by lambda zero up to lambda of P minus one here and zero else. So I have a unitary uh, orthogonal transformation, which brings me to a matrix C, a covariance matrix, which is diagonal. Now this matrix now is, since it's diagonal, it's so-called decorrelated because I have no non-diagonal matrix elements, okay? So what do I read off from the diagonals? If this is, so I have no like covariance matrix with X, which had non-diagonal matrix elements. So we are saying now that the Y or CY is decorrelated. It has no diagonal elements. So what do we have on the diagonal map? What kind of quantity? Somebody mentioned it earlier. It's again, one of these famous quantities from statistics. So we have no correlations between the data. The covariance is zero. So what are we left with on the diagonal? The variance. So what we have now is that with this transformation, we have found the variance. So this lambda zero is the variance of this quantity y zero, etc. So what this means, when I go back to the singular value decomposition, so this means that with the singular value decomposition, SVD, what it means is that we have that the variance of Y of I is now given by the singular values, which I call Sigma I squared divided by N. So I can use the singular value decomposition. I found the singular values of my design matrix. And these are the variances of each of these components. The matrix has been decorrelated. I have performed a similarity transformation and then I've gotten a diagonal matrix. So the eigenvalues of my correlation matrix, no, sorry, my covariance matrix are simply the Singular value squared of a singular value decomposition. Yeah. 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 There are no no. So with yeah, no diag. Oh no, sorry, no non diagonal. Sorry, this was yeah. So we are no no. So people are still awake. Good. I still have five minutes to put you guys to sleep. Okay, so the uh, this is just, I mean, what we are doing here is just a rewrite of things. So there's nothing new here. Now with the principal value component, what we can do now is to do the, uh, the principal component analysis is the following. So if you now look at the total variance, total variance in this case is going to be the sum over all these singular values from i equals zero to p minus one of sigma i squared divided by n. Now, one thing we can say now is the following. So if some of these variances are very small, we just leave them out. So the principal component analysis goes as follows. Uses an approximation or approximates the total variance.
by simply leaving out, by simply leaving out terms with small singular values. So that means that instead of us uh, keeping all the features, we simply keep those which have the largest variance or the largest singular value. This is the same as you keeping those components. So there are two equivalent problems here. So you can uh, calculate a mean squared error where you optimize or minimize actually the difference between the original data and the data with a less number of features. You can optimize that. That is the same as maximizing a problem where you keep the largest variance. So these two problems, so these two problem statements are equivalent. So the traditional PCA theorem was postulated with you starting with one orthogonal vector and then simply transforming your data set with that and then compute the mean squared error with just one, in this case, singular value, which would correspond to the one with the largest variance. Then when you optimize that mean squared error, that is the same as maximizing. Minimizing the, that mean squared error is the same as maximizing your variance. And then you would move on and add more and more components. And at the end, you can obviously build up the full a design matrix which you have with all the degrees of freedom. So the idea now is actually to just keep some few degrees of freedom. So what I'm going to do now is to try to give you some kind of uh, uh, insights and uh, view on what actually happens when you do a PCA. And so let's look at a, a very simple example which you will find in the in today's Jupyter notebook. And then we're going to take a small break. So let's just take a quick look here at the uh, Jupyter notebook again. And I see that there is a question from the people online. Yeah, so the eigenvalues which you have here are actually the same as the variance. So there's a question in the chat here. And uh, because when we do the singular value decomposition, the singular values are the same as the eigenvalues of the covariance matrix. And that's a very neat result because we can only, we only need to deal with our design matrix and our design matrix is defined by our input data. And what you will see in many cases is that people will then take the full data. So you could take the Wisconsin breast cancer data and you could simply calculate the eigenvalues of the current covariance matrix. And you could say now, okay, I keep only those say five eigenvalues, which give me 95% of the variance of the total variance. And then the other ones I just leave out. And then you will say, these are the dominating features. And these are the those which I will carry with me in my machine learning analysis. So that's a way to actually reduce the dimensionality. Now there's obviously a problem as you can see is that to do the PCA with the singular value decomposition, you have to be able to calculate the singular values or diagonalize a matrix. Now, there is something which comes to your rescue when the matrix is huge, because you have iterative methods to diagonalize large eigenvalue problems where you have matrices of more than a million times a million. And these are called Langsos methods when the matrix is symmetric. And that gives you a result which converges to the lowest states or actually those with the largest eigenvalues, it converges to the extremes. So that means that you can actually pick again the largest eigenvalues by iterative schemes. Even if your matrix is a monster matrix with millions of features. So if you're dealing with cancer research and you look at the genetics and you want to trace back a specific tumor to some traits in your DNA, you may have hundreds of thousands of features. And, but perhaps only some few of them matter. Okay, so let me just bring up this very simple example. Uh, so if you scroll down here, there is a, a simple Python code. So many of the things which we have here, things which we 
did. So what I've done now is simply to make a, this is a kind of Mickey Mouse example. So I defined a Gaussian distribution. So I'm gonna define points, 10,000 of these. And my design matrix is gonna be 10,000 times two. So I have two features. And uh, one of them, I just fix the mean value to minus one, the first column. The second column has two. And then I say that my covariance is given by four, two, and two, okay? And what I do next then is obviously to uh, set up everything as you can see here. And, but now, so let's go back to the original case with four and two here. And then we have two and two. So let's run through that one. And then the first step now is up to, to subtract the mean value as we did before. So I subtract out the mean value from each column and I use pandas here. So it's very easy to do that. I calculate the mean and then I have the centered values where I subtracted the mean. And then I can obviously scale it by, and this, uh, you remember that in scikit-learn, you have the standard scalar. And I can uh, divide that by the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the standard deviation. Uh, now I'm setting up the covariance matrix in this specific case. So it's not exactly four, it's not exactly two. That's because I only have 10,000 points and I used a normal distribution, a Gaussian with those specific values. So it's a multivariate Gaussian. So I don't get exactly the same results. And here you see the centered values. Now, what I'm going to do next is to make a plot of my data. So you see now, this would be x1 and this is x0. Now, by looking at this figure, before we take a break, intuitively, what would you say is the variance? Actually, you have the variance in the data which we plugged in, four and two. But would you say here that you could actually uh, eliminate one degree of freedom or not? So if you look at the, the data here, right? So you have a big variance in both directions, right? You have a big scatter. Your big scatter in the vertical one and in the horizontal one. So we have 10,000 points for X0 and X1, but we have a pretty big scatter. So it means that here you don't see a, an axis which seem to be the dominating one because the variance is pretty big in both cases. If you now uh, change this, suppose now you go back and you simply say now that the covariance here is 20. So that means the variance of the first vector is 20. And then we just make this smaller 0.2. And then I say, this is also 0.2. It's symmetric, but then I say that the variance of the second one is very small. So if I rerun it, what you will see then, when you look at the scatter of your data, is something like this. So let's just rerun it. Then it's gonna look like this. So you see now, this is not, I've not done a PCA analysis. But what I did was simply to diagonalize my covariance matrix with uh, these 10,000 data points, which enter the definition of the design matrix. And you see now that most of the data have a huge scatter on the horizontal axis, whereas on the vertical axis, the scatter is very small. And that's reflected in a small variance, right? So what you could say now is that maybe, maybe I can leave out the vertical degree of freedom and now just perform a transformation to just the horizontal degree of freedom. So this is a ways by which we now can eliminate data. So here we're just seeing this by looking at the results. But when you have tons of data, it's very difficult to visualize it. And then you will typically be guided by looking at the uh, largest eigenvalues. And then you will say, okay, these are the eigenvalues I'm going to keep as features. And then I'm going to just delete the other one. So just take them out. So this is the essence of the 
principal component analysis. So here you would say by just looking at the graph without having diagonalized, you could say now that from the graph, I see that probably the principal component here is going to be the horizontal axis. Yeah. So um, if you have features uh, of different scales, yeah. Uh, so how do you define the threshold of the amounts? Uh, so this is something. This is a very good question. And again, what you would have to do is to simply say, okay, I keep only ninety percent of the variance, and I calculate my mean squared error. Then I increase it to ninety-five percent of the variance. And if the mean squared error doesn't change much, then you could say I'm safe by just keeping 90% of the total variance. And I leave out those uh, features which have a small variance. So you would have to play around with it. You have to, in all these algorithms, you actually decide how many features you want to keep. So it's actually you, and then you have to calculate uh, scores like the mean squared error and see whether you are happy with that or not. Yeah, it is. Everything you've been doing till now is trial and error. It's the, there's often not, I mean, except for this case here, which is pretty straightforward. And you, you see from the graph here, right? But the, when you have something like, a, let's say, a thousand dimensional problem, it's not so easy to see what is the best feature, right? Okay, I went a little bit over time, but I thought of just bringing this message so that when after the break, we can start looking at more details of the PCA and how we would implement it. So let's take a small break. So what you saw uh, from this uh, example, which we looked at before the break, which in a certain sense is more us doing this by the eye. This contains actually some of the basics of uh, what happens with the PCA algorithm. Uh, the way you can uh, view this now, so the, the PCA theorem, uh, what it does is that it, looking at the variance, you can say that the variance is a kind of measure of the variability of your data, as you saw from that figure we had before the break. And potentially, the number of components which we have is infinite. So you want to squeeze the most information in each component. And of the final set which you uh, uh, want to build, and if to exaggerate you were to select a single principal component, you would want it to account for the most variability possible. So when you're optimizing the problem, and I'm going to show you now before we go through the the details of the algorithm, how you would set up the PCA yourself, we're actually going to look at a maximization problem where we maximize the variability in only one component. So the PCA theorem says that this is equivalent to construct the minimal error where you look at this transformed quantity and compare that with the data you have. So if you take the mean squared error of that and minimize that, that's the same as maximizing the variability. This is essentially the PCA theorem. So let's take a quick look at this maximization problem of the variance. So basically with words here, uh, I'm stating what the theorem says. Uh, so the, as the theorem says that if you just take one component and you could now think of this vector V0, which is the only component you take, and then use that one to uh, express the variance. That means that you want to have as much variance as possible. And uh, in that sense, the search for maximum variance is so that the one component which you end up with, in a way, collects uh, the most uniqueness from the data set. And maximizing the component vector variances, that's the same as maximizing the uniqueness of these vectors. And the vector are as distant from each other as possible. So they should be orthogonal to each other. So when we went back to the, P, to the singular value decomposition, then we already had an orthogonal basis. Now we can, by maximizing the variance, we can build up an orthogonal basis. 
by using a Lagrangian, like we did in connection with support vector machines. So let's take a quick look at that because it's not very difficult actually to see uh, how we can go on. So let's take a switch to the, uh, to the whiteboard and see how we can maximize the variance with just one component. So let me just bring this away. So max variance with one component. So we are still gonna deal with the uh, covariance matrix, but we are going now to assume that there is a vector. So we define a vector S zero and think back to the matrix, which we had this V matrix. So this is just a small link to what we had with the singular value decomposition. In the singular value decomposition, we had a matrix V which is now just given by V0, V1. So these are all orthogonal vectors, Vp minus one. So instead of us having from the singular value decomposition, the whole matrix, we could now think of just picking one, okay? And we want this to be an orthogonal one so that every time we produce a new vector, it should be orthogonal to the other ones. That's an important feature because then they should stay as far apart from each other as possible. Okay, it's pretty intuitive, right? So let's now, instead of calling it V0, we just call it S0. So this is a vector and we assume now that this vector, its norm is now normalized to one. Okay. And this vector is a vector which has a, dimensionality, it contains now the N components as the vector V zero hat here. Actually, actually it has P components, sorry. Because, because V zero has P components. Then what we are going to do now is to uh, also assume that we have assumed that this norm is uh, not infinitely large. So what we want to do now to maximize variance With that constraint, with the above constraint, that means that we can define a Lagrangian. So we would have an L here, which now is given by the transformed covariance matrix, C of X times S zero plus so remember now that this is going to give us the first eigenvalue of the matrix, which again is the variance, right? When we perform this transformation, plus a parameter lambda zero, one minus S zero times S zero. So that's my Lagrangian. So then I'm actually going to uh, calculate the derivatives. And when I calculate the derivatives now, so we calculate derivatives of the Lagrangian. Derivatives with respect to S zero T and Lambda zero. So if I take the derivative with Lambda zero, I just get back the uh, uh, orthogonality relation and normalization relation, right? So if I take S zero, then I get what I get then is obviously the, the first one with the S zero that gives me simply C of X times S zero is going to be given by Lambda zero of S. So C is a matrix, S zero is a vector. So what I'm saying now is that this is an eigenvalue problem with eigenvalue Lambda zero. So that's the only, that's what I'm saying. So 
This will now be the eigenvalue. And then uh, I have that S0 of T0 has to be equal to one. So what I have is an eigenvector is an eigenvalue. So S0 is an eigenvector of the covariance matrix with eigenvalue lambda zero. So maximizing this Lagrangian means that I get back the same eigenvalue problem which I had before, but now I'm having only one component. So just keep that in mind. Then what I could do, uh, I could now say that, because you see quickly now that if I take this equation here, if I multiply with the sigma zero T on both sides of C of X, S zero, this is the same as this transformed covariance, which is simply given by lambda zero. And this is the supposed to be the diagonal matrix. But in our case, this is just a, a matrix where we are only looking at one eigenvalue. So this is the same as the variance of this quantity Y zero. But now we have only one component. So this is the first eigenvector. And it could, if you want to relate this to the singular value decomposition, it could correspond to this first vector, which you see here. So what you're doing now by this maximum variance, building up of the vectors and the eigenvalues, you could actually build up all the orthogonal eigenvectors. So it's just another way of finding the eigenvectors and eigenvalues. What you could do next is you could add a new one. So suppose now that you perform this calculation and uh, you want to compare this with a calculation where you keep all features. So now you're just picking out one feature. And suppose that you have the full feature case and you calculate the mean squared error with a full feature case. And you see that there are, the results don't agree very well. So what you could do next is you could think, okay, maybe I need more than just one component. Uh, then I can add a new component. And the way I would add a new component is to require that that component should be orthogonal to S0. And at the same time, I want that to be an eigenvalue of this covariance matrix. So if you want more components, you can gradually build up all the eigenvectors and then gain back the full set of eigenvalues and all features. So with more, eigenvectors, what we could think of now is that we, suppose now we found that this, uh, when we compare with the full case with all degrees of freedom, that just keeping one is not enough. Then we could ask, how can we add a new eigenvector? So what we could do now is to define an S1, and we want to have this S1 uh, to be obviously orthogonal to S0. So we want that to be zero. So that's a requirement. We also want S1 times S to be equal to one. That means that we can now define a Lagrangian here, which looks like as follows. And remember now that since it's a maximization problem, I actually have plus the Lagrangian parameters as we discussed in connection with support vector machines, if you're dealing with a minimization problem, you have minus the Lagrangian parameters. So we would now have an S1 transpose times the covariance matrix with S1 plus a lambda one, a one minus S1 transpose S1 plus a new parameter, which I just call gamma of S1 transpose of S0. And now we take derivatives again. So we can take derivatives with respect to lambda one, S1 and gamma. 
So we take derivatives and we want to drive them to zero. Take derivatives with respect to S1 transpose, lambda one and gamma. So what we get then is obviously that when I take the derivative with respect to S1, this derivative, I'm going to get C of X multiplied with S1. And I will have a factor of two here, but I divide that one away. So I'm gonna get a factor of two here multiplied with S0. And this is equal to lambda one times S1. And then I have for lambda, I get obviously that S1 transpose times one is equal to one. And for gamma, what I get is simply that S1 transpose S0 is equal to zero. So if I now take and multiply my matrix or the, the first equation, this one, and I multiply that with a, an S0 transpose, what I get then is an S0 transpose times the matrix S1 plus, and then I obviously have gamma divided by two here, and I have S0 transpose times S0. These are already orthogonized, so that is times one. And this is equal to lambda one multiplied with the S0 transpose times S1, and this is actually equal to zero. So when I collect everything, uh, we can actually keep, uh, but let's keep this term uh, S0 uh, times S1. And we know that this one is equal to, to one here. So what we get then is that gamma, if I also take this as an eigenvalue problem, this is the same as we had before. So this becomes lambda zero. So we found the eigenvalue of that problem. We don't know the eigenvalue here yet, but we, can we know this eigenvalue problem. And that means that we can rewrite everything and we find that gamma is then equal to lambda one minus lambda zero multiplied with S zero times S one. And we want this to be zero because this quantity which you have here is actually defined to be equal to zero. So with that, what it means is that I can go back and then I have that C times X times S one is the same as lambda one times S one. So that means that S one is also an eigenvector, is an eigenvector, the covariance matrix of C and lambda one is an eigenvector as well, an eigenvalue. So what you can do now is actually to, and this lambda eigenvalue, lambda one is now given by the variance of uh, what we call Y one here. So we can then build up all the eigenvectors successively by maximizing the Lagrangian, where we require that we have a maximum variance. So that means that we can uh, uh, simply by induction, we can then set up a very simple uh, scheme where we now calculate, have a Lagrangian for all eigenvalues and eigenvectors, lambda i and the eigenvectors s of i. What we would do then is simply to set up a Lagrangian, which we maximize, where we have an s of i t times a c of x, times S of I plus the orthogonality requirement for the vector itself and normalization requirement, plus a sum which runs through all the eigenvectors up to I minus one. And where we have a parameter gamma of J multiplied with S I times S J here. So the, what happens then is that we get more and more requirements, but this is something which we can solve uh, and then gradually build up the whole set of uh, 
eigenvectors and eigenvalues of the covariance matrix. However, uh, this is normally not what you want to do because you want to get rid of some features. So the basic idea is that you set a cutoff over the total variance, and you would say that eigenvalues, which have a value smaller than that, or variance smaller than that, are just left out. So you would have to figure out then whether the kind of mean squared error you get by increasing the number of degrees of freedom, this is actually what you're doing, by increasing the number of degrees of freedom, you have to figure out whether you are happy or not with the score which you get. So if you have only one feature and you do a principal component analysis, you can calculate your score. It could be the mean squared error, it could be the accuracy score. And then you will say, okay, this looks good. Then I'm pretty happy because one feature seems to explain the data. If you're not happy, you keep increasing till you reach what you might call a satisfactory description of the data. So what satisfactory is, is something you have to decide. So let's now look at how we would implement it. So there's one thing which I didn't say, uh, and that's the uh, kind of proof of the theorem, which starts with you having only one component S0, and that allows you to define your model. And then you would subtract from that the data you want to describe. And then you minimize the mean squared error with just one component. Minimizing that is equivalent to maximizing the variance. So this would be called the minimization problem is the residual error, which comes from you having chosen only one component. And then you can keep adding components. So you can actually show that this leads to, this minimization problem is fully equivalent with a maximization of the variance. So I'm not gonna go through that because it would take me another hour, but you will find it in basically all textbooks on the principal component analysis. And that textbook, which is linked in the slides, which is called the generalized principal component analysis, shows you the, the theorem with the minimization, which is equivalent to the maximization of the variance. Now, this method has been widely used for imaging, for instance, compression of images, and it's been very popular there, but you can also use it as a guidance to reduce the dimensionality of your problem. So let's look at the basic steps here. And then we go back to the codes and uh, try to look at how we can write our own code. Because as you saw from that simple example, which I showed you, it's pretty straightforward to go ahead and write your own code here. The only thing you need to do with your design matrix is actually to construct the covariance matrix and diagonalize it. And then you set a cutoff where you decide that this is the number of components I want to keep. It's actually very useful because you will often see that many of the components don't bring much to the discussion. And there will be some important features which are the leading ones. If you do that, if that's the case in your data analysis, then you can tell the reader, these are the most important components in the discussion of the data set. This is uh, perhaps one of these methods, which is the closest to decision trees when it comes to interpretability. So if you take a, like the cancer data, when you set up the decision tree for that, you would then have the different branches and they will say that, okay, this factor is the most important one. And then you get all the other ones. By doing a principal component analysis, you get a similar insight about the problem. And it's very useful. So actually many people use that in analysis of data. And you don't need to call this machine learning actually. This is a plain linear algebra approach, which has been widely used in, for instance, imaging to compress images. Actually before CNNs came to the market, the singular value decomposition was one of the dominating methods in image recognition and compression of images. So that's the, uh, before, before many of these methods came, came, to, to, came to, to, uh, to the field. So let's look at the basic steps which we need to set up. And I'm going to put up some images here so we can illustrate that. 
So suppose now we go back to this simple matrix which we had. So we had this matrix X with an X zero zero, X one zero, and now we can augment it. And suppose we have uh, lots of points. So we have some N minus one of zero, and then we have an X uh, zero one, X one one, and this goes all the way to X N minus one of one. And this is what we normally, what we would call a vector X zero. And then we have the vector X one here. So this is our data set, two features only. And that's gonna allow me to make a, a two dimensional plot. And as you probably know, I mean, this is almost beyond my capabilities when it comes to plotting. So the first thing you will do is to scale the data. Okay, so we calculate First step is scale the data or mean subtraction. Mean value subtraction is the first step. So that means that our X goes over to a matrix X bar which is the same as the previous one, minus this uh, vectors mu. And this n vector mu, this, this is a matrix, is actually given by mu zero, which is just a constant here, and mu one, where the mu's are the mean values. It's not needed always, but people normally do that in order to avoid eventual risks with the uh, round off errors and similar things. And you've seen probably that in many, many applications, people typically scale the data when they run any of the machine learning algorithms. So that means that if you take a, if you make a plot here, so suppose now this is our data set. So this will be the unscaled data to the left. So we have X zero and X one. And suppose we have zero here. So we could have a data set, which looks something like this. And then you scale it. So we get an X zero scaled and an X one scaled. Then what you would see, it will, will be concentrated more around a given, a given zero here or reference point. The next thing you do, if you can, is what's called standardization. So we have subtracting the mean, mean subtraction, but then you have a standardization. So often these terms are can be a little bit confusing because people mean both mean subtractions and division by the standard deviation as standardization. Uh, in scikit-learn, this is called the, the standard scalar. So you scale by subtracting the mean and you scale it again by dividing by the standard deviation. So standardization means actually divide the points. If you do have the variance, then you can calculate the standard deviation to divide the points the points with the standard deviation. of a data set. So in our case, that would be the standard deviation for the ve vector X0 and the vector X1. And Pandas is very nice there as a software in the sense that the Pandas library actually has a possibility to just, you would just be able to subtract the mean value for each col column and then divide by the standard deviation for each column. So this is almost done automatically with Pandas. And the benefit here, is that you have a unitless and dimensionless quantities. Gives dimensionless quantities. And I should say, and no units, and also, and no units. So these are quantities 
the things which are pretty often often done. Then the next step is to perform this uh, eigen decomposition of the covariance matrix. And if you can use a, a singular value decomposition or just a plain eigenvalue solver, you would just use that. So we will just write this as an eigen decomposition. of the covariance matrix. So the uh, what you could say then is another thing you what which is done is that you scale the eigenvectors by the eigenvalues. Eigenvectors are scaled by the magnitude of the eigenvectors. Of the corresponding eigenvectors, no, sorry, of the corresponding eigenvalues. And the clearly the longer vectors, they span the principal subspace. And uh, if you now uh, make a plot here of the, the same quantities which we're looking at, you could now think of uh, this will be the scale data which we have, x1. And you, if you now look at the data points which you have, it could be something like this. And if we center it, there would be an eigenvector, which is orthogonal to the other ones. And here we would have the longest eigenvectors, which is the one which has the uh, largest variance here. And the ellipse, which you see, which is, so this would be the data points. And the ellipse, which is spanned by these vectors, that defines actually your covariance matrix. So these are just simple geometrical interpretation, which you can make. Then the next thing you can do then is actually project any data point uh, onto the principal subspace. So this is the final step which would typically be done. So you could now do this final step. This is the projection step. And that is project any data. data point onto the principal onto the principal subspace. And the principal subspace is the one which has the most important eigenvector and the largest eigenvalue. And that means that what we are gonna get then could be something like this. So if we make a plot now the data, it could now mean that we, the principal component would obviously be this one. So that means that you can project all the data points into that axis defined by that vector. So that means that your data now, x1 would now be given by the line defined by this vector. And you would have all your points on this line here. And that would define your main degree of freedom. And then what you have to do is simply to calculate uh, quantities like accuracy score. You would calculate the mean squared error if you're doing a regression case or any other type of relevant score which you're interested in. And then you could then decide whether this is satisfactory or not. So let's go back to the Jupyter Notebook and uh, take a look at some practicalities and how we can actually do this ourselves. <laughs> so as you can see, the basic idea is pretty simple. And this is the, the more kind of standard, <coughs> sorry, this is a kind of standard PCA approach, but then there are many, many different variants of it, but this is the basic entry point. Just need to grab some water here.
Okay. <laughs> Let me just take this off from the recording here. So what we're going to do, what we're going to do now for the rest of the lecture is actually to look at how we could write our own code. And the first example is actually the one which we put up here, which is a simple illustration. So this is a case where we now calculate a multivariate normal distribution where we have defined the mean value <laughs> and the covariance matrix. And the first step, as we said, <coughs> Is to, is to center the data. So we have a centered matrix where we take out the mean values. And Pandas is a tool which allows us to easily do that. As you can see here, we calculate the mean value for every column and then simply subtract that from uh, the original design matrix. Then you can scale it by dividing by the uh, standard deviation. And uh, in this case here, the diagonal covariance matrix elements will then be one when you scale it because you're dividing by the variance squared. And the non-diagonal elements would in this case, when the original matrix, which we had, which now did not have this, but it had four and two here, that matrix will have, when we scale it, it will have one along the diagonals and it will have two divided by square root of two as a covariance for the non-diagonal elements or standard deviation then. And then we would scale it. We have centered the data. And this is the matrix which we would have with a centered matrix. And finally, we also had the case here where we now simply set up the covariance matrix. And then we plotted everything as a function of all the data points. And this was a typical scatter which we got in this case here. Now it, we have to rerun it. <clears throat> so in, in this particular case, by definition, the scatter in the data was pretty large in both cases. And it means that by looking at this example here, that there is no axis which stands out as a dominating, clearly dominating axis. So in this case, I would actually keep both features if that is the case. But then, uh, so the Typical, if you want to collect all the steps, uh, you would find the eigenvectors of your covariance matrix. And when you have the eigenvectors, you can obviously print them and you can study them and so on. So if you can calculate it, you can look at the first eigenvector, the second eigenvector. And then you can do a PCA analysis, either yourself by looking at the eigenvalues, or you can let scikit-learn do it. And then you can define the number of components you want to keep. So scikit-learn has a functionality here, uh, which is simply called PCA, pretty obvious. And you can define the number of components you want to use as the major type of component. Uh, this uh, code, which you see here, does not contain uh, all of your bow elements, but it shows how you can use scikit-learn to extract the eigenvector which corresponds to the largest eigenvalue. And the, uh, if we scroll down a little bit more, there are further examples. And we, we also have some links with the singular value decomposition here. So we are setting up a, a plane matrix here where we perform the singular value decomposition. The matrix is scaled. And here I set up the singular value decomposition. And then we can uh, easily then uh, when we look at this matrix here, we can easily figure out which are the most important components. So let's just take a quick look at this. So this will be the matrix which we have. And then we will then find that uh, the eigenvectors, so when we look at this specific matrix here, and we now take the uh, first uh, two objects and then the, the final one here, we will then see that there are specific components here that the, which would be of more interest than the other ones. And the PCA assumes typically that the data set is normally centered around the origin. 
And the scikit learns PCA class actually takes care of the centering of the data for you. In the examples which I put up here, I'm actually doing the centering myself by using pandas. But if you're using scikit-learn, just keep in mind that scikit-learn actually does it for you. As I said, once you have identified all the principal components, then you can reduce the dimensionality of the data set down to D dimensions by projecting it onto the hyperplane defined by the first D principal components. And selecting that ensures that the projection will preserve as much variance as possible. And scikit-learn has a, a very simple way of doing this for you. You would then simply define import uh, PCA. Uh, you define two components here. You perform the transformation and you can print the matrix and then you decide uh, to look at the uh, PCA components. And uh, if you look at this specific case here, you can then simply just uh, set up the components, which, oops, the kernel appears to have died. And, ah, okay. Okay. Dead kernel. So let me just reach, load it here. Okay, let's see now why. By the way, I see that we are getting close to the end. So what I'm gonna to do tomorrow is to, uh, when we start the first lecture, I'm going to wrap up uh, the applications of the uh, PCA to the cancer data and look at how we can actually use PCA to reduce the dimensionality there. And when we are done with that, I'm going to show you how you can use the K-mean clustering method, which is another way of dealing with the data from an unsupervised point of view. And then we are just going to summarize and wrap up and point to uh, different other courses and other things which you can do with machine learning. So I see that time is running out now. Uh, and this kernel actually died. Maybe that was a signal that I should stop because else I would have gone quite a lot of time here. So uh, let, let's pick up this uh, more tomorrow when we start. Okay. So I'm going to put off the recording here.